Check to check, 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 and check it out. Episode 40. <laughs> it's what it's all about, pal. Special episode. Fucking four episode zero. 40. Fucking hell. Mental. Mental. This is the this is my episode, episode then. Yeah, well, fucking start talking, pal. Yeah, well, then fucking pass me the microphone, motherfucker. <laughs> Do you know what? Right, wait to hear this. I had the weirdest dream last night. And... It was, it was quite basic, but it was very specific. I was taking pills with Gordo. That was my dream last night. In like Spain or something. <laughs> <laughs> Gordo creeping while I'm sleeping. The fuck's going on there? That would be fucking hilarious. Was that mad? That was nowhere. Taking pills. <laughs> Taking <laughs> pills in, in, in a beat or something with Gordo. I would have fucking I woke up and was like, the fuck was that all about? <laughs> fucking absolute classic breakfast and Gordo's. That would have been yeah, so I'm, I'm, That I'm actual not a big, experience uh, would have been good as well. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a big, I'm not, I'm not a big dreamer. So when I do dream, I'm, I'm still kind of waking up going, what's that? Yeah, you get those ones where you're kind of waking up going... I had one. Oh, I had that shit. I, I had one uh, last week. I kind of, I think I've had it twice now. It's more, it's closer to a nightmare than it is a dream where I'm in bed asleep and I hear people. I hear the gate. So we have to, the gate outside. It's kind of, it's like a barn gate, and it kind of rocks in the wind and makes some noise, bangs and clangs. And I heard it while I was asleep. And I, I, where I, I, I look <laughs> up and I check. We have a bike rock, bike racks in the garden. You have the bikes locked up there, and you need to check in, thinking somebody's at the bikes or whatever it is. And then I did a journey a dream, and I saw loads of people coming in and climbing in the windows into the Nightmare. house. Nightmare. And going around into the side entrance. And then this, um, you know, when you're half asleep, half awake, yeah. kicks into you, right? So you have this sleep paralysis. Yeah, yeah. Where you, like, you know, if you're in a fight in a dream, you can't swing your arms, you know? Or if you're, I have another oh, one. Power, it's the, the fucking car. worst feeling Is ever, it? man. I've had the shit kicked out of me in dreams. <laughs> can't fucking fight back. Get on back, get on back. But that happens to me now, and I know that I'm in a dream, and then I try to wake myself up. So I'm like, I'm, I'm like trying to like flick my arm or something, you know? Yeah. And this is happening in Jordan, the one where I thought people were breaking into the house or trying to rob the bikes. And I was there going, right, sorry, it's beside me. I'll just kind of, you know. She's a light sleeper. If I make some movements, you know what's going on. Because I had to yeah. ask me all the time. Yeah. And scare bleeding shitless. And then you wake up. Oh, fuck, oh, thank God for that. You look outside, bikes are all still there. Back asleep. Same thing happens straight away. I'm like, right, that's it. I'm just not going to sleep. You have to get up. I remember what you were talking about change your physiology. Hmm. Just get up, go downstairs, you know, have Shake a glass of water up. or something. Shake it out. Yeah, and then go back. Another one I have, what I used to have until I got it sorted. Do you ever have teeth dreams? Teeth dreams? Yeah, teeth dreams. I have dreams that I have an underbite that's stuck, and then when I pull it back, I smash all four front teeth at the top. Fucking Christ. <laughs> oh, what I'm looking at here, Chief. Hold on. Hold on. Stay there. Show and tell, it's show and tell. Show and tell with Cameron Higgs. Is it a toy? Oh. Is it a clothes? A couple of years ago, when I was a kid, my brother was in a fucking, I think him and his mates were having a few cans in like an abandoned gaff or something like that. I found this book called yeah. The Book of Dreams, right? This book's fucking been in my family for about fuck, 20 years. What did you say your, uh, what did you say your d- dream was about? You lost your teeth, was it? Yeah, I lost my teeth. Now I'm, I am the single most logical person in the whole entire world. Right? Yeah. I believe in something that is absolutely true and proven by science. If not, I don't believe in it. So, like, I don't believe in even like a dream. soul. I don't believe in a soul. I, you know, I don't believe dreams are you trying to tell yourself something. I think dreams is just you. You know, bad dreams or nightmares are just stuff that you're worried about, and other dreams are just. You know, it's just something that you're thinking about. You know what I mean? 
I I will have a book it out for mine, pal. I've only got the book of dreams out for you. He's yeah. all, he's <laughs> all over my fucking brain. Go on, let's go. I don't let's believe go, anything go. about anything, pal. Two yeah, things I'm getting here. An aching tooth in a dream pretends family squabbles and upset business conditions. The dream of having a tooth... Fi- no, that's bollocks. Um, <laughs> hold on. Having a tooth... Falling in- out. Having a tooth extracted signifies a good opportunity to make investments or a change in your business. That's bollocks. Um, fucking, how would you describe it? There's all sorts. Well, yeah, what about having a dream that you're late for school and you get into school and you forget what subject you have, what classroom you have to go to, See, and where the office is? <laughs> this is just. This is just giving me. This is just giving me one word. So it's like fucking. Like if I look up. What was feet. it? Feet. Huh? Feet. What are we dreaming of feet? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. What do we got here? What happens if you dream of feet? To dream of bathing the feet foretells a pleasant relief from anxiety. If you dream of seeing your own feet, it means that your position is insecure. To dream of... <laughs> 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 to dream of seeing many feet walking along a pavement pretends material loss. It's fucking oh interesting God. shit, man. Interesting. Or, or you're a Nordy called Raymond. If you dream of feet. <laughs> <laughs> Sucking on them toes. You know what? Did you have the book there? I've got a couple of questions for you and you just... You just segue to question number three, seriously, there. And it was to recommend three books. Okay. The book one to dream. do. The book of dreams. <laughs> Apart from the book of dreams. Found in, a, in, one, a, in an abandoned house near you. One to do with weightlifting. One to do with, like, you know, overall fitness. And then one to do with, with well, with, like, well-being. Okay. So... Uh, I'll start with the first one uh, to do with well-being. Uh, it's a bit of a it's it's not an easy read necessarily, but it's probably one of the most insightful. So, uh, it's called "Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers" by Robert Sapolsky. Why zebra? Fuck me. Hiccups. What happens if you dream of hiccups? Um, Why zebras don't get ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. Um, he talks, it's, he talks a lot about stress. He talks about a lot about the impact of stress, why these things happen. Um, and it'll give you an insight on things that maybe you didn't understand about yourself and your own body. Um, so in terms of well-being, understanding that is absolutely game-changing. Um, in terms of lifting and health, fuck me, man, it's tough. Um, it's what, tough. Was the last, what was the last book you read? What was the last book I read? The last book I read was The Obstacle is a Way, is the Way by a guy called Ryan Holiday, um, which is about stoic philosophy. It's basically about the biggest obstacles that people have overcome in their life and how to manage your mind to overcome anything, um, which is a very interesting read, really, really good read um, for anyone. Uh, the, be- the best books on training necessarily it's difficult when it comes to training like there's very very complicated shit but if we're talking about for someone who wants to kind of get an entry level into things like Mm -hmm. for strict strength training and learning like okay right i'm fucking stepping into the gym i would say either starting strength by mark ripito who's a classic uh, strength coach he's a famous guy who basically said that strong people are harder to kill and more useful in general than weak people, which is, you kind of get an indication of where that guy's coming from. Um, So starting strength is very, very good. Um, For just general fitness and stuff like that, a book called Functional Strength Training by Mike Boyle. Um, By Boyle Sport, he runs something called Boyle Sports in Boston. Um, He's fucking badass. So functional training um, or functional strength training. Um, is very very good and it'll just give you a diverse load of fucking different uh load of different things you can dive into in terms of your training um you ever read um autobiographies <laughs> i've had, i've read some very strict <laughs> like some like i read the last autobiography i read was george hooks <laughs> 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 the old fucking cretin off the right what was the foot the right hook on news talk in ireland and then he was the 
it's a rugby fucking broadcaster on RTE, which is the Irish fucking. Um, uh, what did he get? What did he get slaughtered for recently? What did he say? Like he's just talking. He's too old. And he was just talking fucking. He was something about bollocks, what women man. wear. He said something, yeah, he said something, something fucking misogynistic or racist. Very interesting story, though. Very interesting story he about has. mental health. Yeah, and for mental health, he was the first person to sell calculators in Ireland. And apparently calculators in like the 50s and 60s were like the size of my fucking couch. Like they were massive fucking things that you had to drive them around. And he was selling them. Apparently he made a load of money doing that. And he was coaching a bit of rugby. And then he went, he fucking went off the rails completely in the 80s or something like that. And spoken about several suicide attempts, which is fucking mental to hear, to be honest. Um, I thought it was quite interesting, but um, I think he's 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 let himself go massively in the last couple of years. Um, just I read uh, Peter Crouch's one, which was very Good. very funny, very very funny. Um, and I really love um, autobiographies by cyclists. Yeah. Um, um, I I used to not, but I was watching the GCN show one time. And he was talking about that. He got, the reason what got me into cyclist autobiographies was because he said they're all they were all dopers. Every one of them was a doper. And he goes, I, I hate to I, I hate to encourage. I, want, I don't want to make them money because he goes, you know, my career was stunted because I was a clean cyclist and I could never make it. And that was the reason why I what don't want to give name? them money to this cyclist. Do you remember his name is Simon Richardson? Is is the guy who was talking about this? And um, he said that he gets all his autobiographies from charity shops instead of buying them yep. from Eastons or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good call. Good show, isn't it? I used to fucking even, even Lance Armstrong and everybody, all of them. And he said that he'd only get them books out of charity shops. And I was like, I'm going to do that. Because do you shops recycling are center. Recycling center. Fucking see you later. Whole fucking stack of them in the corner. Fucking yep. free. See you later, pal. Big time. I, had, I, had a, I had a video that popped up of my dog fucking around with some grapes or something yesterday that popped up my memories and then the back was my old um, bookshelf and this is so much it was it, it held about 300 books you got rid of it all, yeah I got rid of every book over the space of about two years Jesus man not yeah. right I, for some reason like the, the books to me I like having books you know what I mean? Yeah. As much space yeah. as they fucking take up, I, I do like having them. Last, the book I read before that was um, was Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Fucking mind blown. Really. Yeah, I love that, yeah. I really, really, really enjoyed that. Um, for anyone that hasn't read that, that has any kind of interest, not even interest in fitness or sports. It's not the exact. It's a phenomenal story. Yeah, whenever <laughs> anybody in, in Chef Fit is saying, does anybody recommend a book? That's the one that I recommend. Other than that, I just read I read fantasy novels all the time. That's not, yeah. yeah. You know, but totally. other books like autobiographies and stuff like that, I'll pick maybe one up a year or something and read that. Yeah, totally. But there, yeah. you know, that can't can't hurt me. Is a life is, changer for everyone who reads it. He's such a unique human being. For anyone who doesn't know, David Goggins is a Navy SEAL and he's an ultra marathon runner and he's a mo- he's a motiv- I don't even know if he's a motivational speaker, but he's one of the biggest motivators in the world. Um, and I remember he got on Joe Rogan's podcast about fucking two years ago, I believe. And he just blew up from there. Everyone was fucking talking about him because he's so real. And his story is bizarre because he went from being this guy who was highly ill-disciplined and fat and obese and hated his fucking life. And he became this uber machine of a fucking man because he had a real troubled childhood you know, hated his life, was doing a fucking menial job. He was an exterminator or something like that, which is actually, you're just killing insects and rats. Um, and he made a decision to fucking join the Navy SEALs. And uh, they're the most elite fucking fighting force in the world. And their training is insane. So he had to drop like 100 pounds, which is over 40 kilos to even get into the program, to do, to even enter the discussion of doing the training for, to enter the SEALs. So, you know, so he, get, like he, start, he starts from when he was a kid and the abuse from his dad all the way through how he hated his life to fucking becoming a SEAL, losing all that weight, and then becoming an ultra marathon runner and taking it forward. And there's lessons in each chapter. Fucking mind-blowing. And it's so real as well, which is why, which is something that you don't see a lot of real 
like really easy to read, no fucking pretentiousness, not a college educated person in any way, shape or form, but totally from the heart, totally raw and totally real. Um, and I think anyone can take massive, massive lessons from that. And just perspective, perspective is huge. Understanding, like for him, perspective was such a big one because we think our lives are so difficult. And then you look at someone who voluntarily put themselves through hell, you know, running fucking marathons on a broken leg. The story with, about his first, his first ever long run, like the 20 hour. Yeah. yeah. And he brought, and he had no preparation. Yeah, didn't do any preparation for it. Didn't fucking bring any. He had like three old school protein bars. That was all he had for a 24 hour race. And it was a hundred miles. And it was like, he ended up collapsing or something, shitting himself. His fucking ankle was broken or something. His body just gave out, just stopped working. Um, and it was mad. And he was like, just a, and he was like a massive 16 stone fucking big black dude, jacked, you know? And he's racing against these little like 50 kilo fucking Asian people. And he's just like, he's trying to keep up with them. Just pure mental toughness, you know? In terms of mental, like mindset and mental toughness, that's the shit you need to be reading. I always go to Navy SEAL stuff. I always go to, to like the books I read. Like I love reading, like I'm a, my weird thing that people might know about me is I'm a, a big history buff. I love war history. I love it. Like, um, and it's something I've really dived into a lot. You know, so I always go to, you know, something based around the military because I think there's a lot of lessons to be taken away from it. So, yeah, Can't Hurt Me by, by David Goggins is a fucking big one. I think everyone should read that book or get the audio book. That's even fucking cooler because he actually speaks and you can hear him talk about it and discuss each thing. It's amazing. Um, Did you read Kitchen Confidential? Bourdain. I haven't read it, yeah. you know. Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good book. Is it? Really, uh, yeah, into the mindset of chefs back then. No, I like, I like Bourdain. I've watched fucking No Reservations and every, I think I've watched every Bourdain thing there is, but I never, I never read his book, but I should probably give it a read. Um, Did you see the one where he made his, made his knife with the meat ear stone? See that I did episode? see that. I did see that. They're fucking, there's some, there's some lad who does that shit. He makes those knives like, they're mad fucking yeah. looking yokes, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Little even better even better did you see the episode where he went to dublin <laughs> no. oh man what no, 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 no. the layover watch it on netflix tonight it's the fucking funniest i swear to fuck even if you're fucking english and you're listening to this or wherever the fuck you're from this is ridiculous so the lad he arrives in dublin, one episode one episode it's classic because it's so fucking like the the end of it, he finishes in a chipper. He goes for a pint in Hogan's, and he goes to a ch some lad. He meets three fucking gougers in a bar, you know, <laughs> and they're like, he got talking to them, and he's doing them the fucking classic American thing. Will you like fucking show me? And the lads are like, uh, yeah. So they take him to a chipper called Roma on fucking Camden Street. <laughs> Camden Street, where I went for lunch when I was in Sing Street. <laughs> Classic. And it's like the, the scene, there's a picture of me and my girlfriend screenshotted it. There's a point where the lads take him into the chipper and they're like chips, curry sauce, a whirly burger, a spice burger, fish, like smoked fucking cod or some shit. And they're eating it. And he's giving it the large, the large one, like, this is like classic Irish fare, you know, and the lads there. <laughs> At one point, Bourdain's talking, and across from him, there's some, for one of these gougers in the bar who can't actually communicate. It's the, like, they got the smart one out of the tree to talk. He's the one conversing with Bourdain. It's a lad in the back. He doesn't even fit in the fucking table. He's actually sitting behind them on another table, and he's just got a batter burger in his hand, a load of garlic mayo smothered all over the side of his face. Like, I'm not talking, joking you. Like this is like three a.m. after a night of drinking gouger material here with the fucking garlic mayo all over his fucking face, the fucking really? wordy burger in his hand. It's like what? The last, the last episode of Kitchen, not Kitchen Confidential, of um, Anthony Bourdain's show that I watched was when he was in Paris and he was drinking the absinthe. Yeah, and they got they. Uh, it just annoyed me. It was the last episode I watched because I was so annoyed by it when they start like 
you get going all wavy and using special effects as he was drinking the apple. Not about he's talking about dreams and I was like, right, that's a lot of bollocks. And bollocks. That's, uh, man, I way preferred no reservation. Like, I way prefer when it's just, you're actually just going somewhere and eating lethal food and it's a fucking, and it's a bit of crack and you get to see what the place is about. I don't need a narrative. I don't need yeah. a fucking, a political motive behind the fucking episode. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think when he did the London one, he was talking about Brexit. It's like, shut the fuck up, man. Yeah. Like, who gives a fuck? Like, yeah. get into what you're there for. Don't give me the fucking narrative. Um, yeah, big time. The old Kitchen Nightmares were lethal as well. That was a show. They're they brilliant. That, they went, the UK one was good. The yeah. fucking US one was garbage. Fucking. I hate that when they, they show you the whole episode at the yeah. start with like, and then Chef Gordon, and then it's like it's like a four minute intro of everything that's going to happen, yep. and then they do that at every ad break because well. it's already because the difference was they overproduced that shit. They have a fucking massive budget, and it's basically we'll build you a new restaurant, and Gordon will shout at you. That's the American show. The UK one was you have these real restaurants that are in the shit that Gordon Ramsay goes to, and he was just coming out, this is like early 2000s, so he was still at the peak of his fucking powers as a chef, and he'd come in, and he genuinely sorted out, and it was real fucking interaction, and he'd really sort out what the fuck was going on there, and you already wouldn't, and you'd see just- yeah, be a fucking stoner chef the parties, and they're like, I don't care, man. You don't fucking care. And they're like, no, nah, man, I, I don't. Dreamer! <laughs> yeah. Have you cooked your muscle before? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, he was but it was that. good. Like I was fucking good. I really enjoyed it. Was. That. Um, still do actually. But uh, yeah, the US one was fucking garbage, man. Fucking Christ. I can. I have gotten very. I thought we were addicted. doing an episode that you were asking me questions. Completely. We we were. Yeah, it's a, it's it's more it's more meandering, right? So I'm going to try and bring it back. I absolutely hooked on going down to the gym and lifting weights right um and then so this is that's where my story now is where my story begins with weightlifting and i wanted to know what yours was i know like we all know your background now at this stage with the rugby and that but where was it when weightlifting clicked in did you have a moment when you went fuck this is it now this is what i fucking want to do yeah i'm going i'm going through a bit of that now yeah totally every day i want to go down you know what i mean like the seeds were planted very early for me. I can remember my brother bringing home a fucking Argos bench that he got off his mate when I was like 12 or 11. And I was out in the shed and I go out and I just fucking bang out stuff. So I'd always been interested in lifting weights. But when I got serious, like rugby was always a conflict with lifting for me because I would always be injured from fucking playing rugby. Like it's very difficult to go into the gym when your shoulder's fucked and you're fucking concussed or whatever. So after I, I retired at fucking because of back injuries at like 19 and I'd always loved the strength and conditioning side of it. I'd always loved the lifting side of it and being in the gym and I was always the strongest guy on the team or whatever was going on. I always held all the records in the weight room. So it was all, it was a natural thing for me to go and do it, you know, and when I was reached 19 then and I just started lifting, like purely lifting, I totally fell in love with it and I slowly found my way geared towards powerlifting and yeah i'd always followed sport i'd always followed you body find that as like the rawest form of weightlifting the powerlifting yeah, totally. one yeah. fucking you know the three disciplines one yeah. lift yeah. who can fucking lift the most up off the ground totally i'd always been attracted to strength i'd always followed i'd always followed bodybuilding i'd always followed strongman competitions i always used to watch world's strongest man even fucking years ago when marius pujanowski was fucking world champion yeah. I, then, I used to watch that as a kid with my with my brothers when that was the only thing that was on at one o'clock in the morning on channel four totally and we had magnus for magnus and the lads yeah. and then i stopped watching it for about 20 years or whatever i i, started, I went back recently and watched like the last 10 amazing. years of it and, amazing oh, amazing brilliant and I'd always loved strongman. I'd always loved powerlifting. And I'd followed all three sports, even Olympic weightlifting. I was actually big into Olympic weightlifting because I'd done a bit of that when I was playing rugby. So I got into all of these sports. So I'd always been a big fan and a student of strength and, you know, everything to do with fitness. That was my background. And for a lot of people nowadays, lifting is very different. Like lifting is very recreational for a lot of people, you know, so it's all about taking a photo for Instagram, wearing your fucking leggings or check out. Like 
for my for the school that I came from, like the school of thought that I came from, was kind of old school lifter mentality where it did none of that fucking shit matters. It's about fucking getting in and lifting, pal. What can you fucking put up? So when I was 19, I, I found a program. I was watching YouTube videos and I found a powerlifter called Brandon Lilly. Um, and I, I bought his, his program or his book called The Cube Method. And that was the first powerlifting program I ever did. Um, and Brandon had a really, he was an interesting guy. And I actually met him a couple of years later. I actually went to one of his seminars and gave him a load of weed. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in Dublin because he was like, he said in the middle of the seminar, I would hate if anyone had a load of marijuana here. Wink. And all these <laughs> fucking nerds around me. I was like, none of these fucking games smoke fucking weed. Anyway, so I gave, him, I gave him a load of weed. But, I got you back. But I was like, listen, man, uh, I spoke to John with him out in the car park. This was years ago. And I was like, you got me into this sport, man. Um, I wouldn't be doing this and I wouldn't have this career without you. So thank you. Um, that was just almost been about three years ago, three and a half years ago. And um, anyway, he w- that was the first program I got into. And I remember doing that. I remember having the cube method. And I used to, I still have all my training logs, all these little books that I used to keep. And I can remember, I, was, I think I was, I defer, after I finished school, I fucking, I, I, st- I went back to college and I was in town and I remember I'd be on the dart, the train, like, and I just, even in the cafeteria before I go into class, I remember I'd ha- I'd know the program and then I'd, I'd program for myself and I'd write out like 12 weeks of training. Like, here's my exercise, here's my sets, here's my reps, here's the percentages. And I'd calculate every, every set that I was going to do. And I remember the, just this feeling of excitement that I'd plan all this shit out, I'd write it out. And I'd be so excited to get into the gym. Like I couldn't contain myself. It was, a, it was, and they call that the iron bug. That's what it's called. You catch the iron bug where you fall in love with it. And um, that was the moment when I was like 19, 20. I was already a good athlete. I was already a big lifter at that point, but that was when it got serious for me. Um, and that's when it got competitive. And then from there, it turned into, I, t- I did that program, got strong. I moved on to another program called the Juggernaut Method. And it, ju- it was just a case of me. I was, I was self-taught. I was self-trained. I'd, I'd take these programs. I'd adapt them to myself. I'd do them. I'd write fucking everything down. And over the course of two or three years, I'd, I'd kind of started doing YouTube videos for fitness then. Fucking God knows if anyone can go back and watch those. God fucking christ please don't do that we will now <laughs> so i started doing those youtube videos started for set up an instagram all of that and that was the start and i called it no mess powerlifting that was what my original profile was called no mess powerlifting and i just post my old lifts or i post all yeah. my lifts that were that were constantly ongoing after about two or three years of that obviously i got out of the service industry i became a coach and all of those things and i then started competing in powerlifting you know and i think i competed about six or seven times um and it was definitely something that adapted over time that i wanted to push and i always had this thought because i was a naturally good squatter that i wanted to be the best i wanted to be the strongest junior squatter in ireland i wanted to squat 260 kilos in competition was the was the biggest squat a junior had ever done it's done by barry That's junior 21s or 18s 123s and barry payton oh, 22 and under um and Barry Piggott, who a uh, guy I know now, um, he's one of the strongest people in the world. Um, I've trained with him a couple of times. Like he's literally a gold medalist at worlds at at ninety kilos and hundred kilos. Like you've never seen. He's called Freak Boy. Uh, it's his nickname. Just look up Barry Piggott. He's a he's a good guy. He's a he's a. He wouldn't be a good friend of mine, but I'd know if I saw him. Like I'd have a good conversation with him. Um, but I remember, it was his record, and he was about two years older than me. And I remember I was like, I'm going to beat him. 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 And I remember the prep. And there was so many. I could probably go back into my Instagram and find some of this shit. When it got very, very serious, I think I was about 21, 22. And I was doing promotions for vape pens. I just left my brother's restaurant. I was doing part-time bar work. And I'd thought I couldn't hack the service industry. So I was doing fucking vape pen promotions, driving around the country, and I was lifting like a cunt. I was about 110 kilos. I was taking weight. I was trying to get as fucking big as possible to do this thing, and I was competing at 105 kilos. I remember doing this program called Small Off. Small Off is a, f- it's hell. It's hell on earth. Anyone that's into lifting, that Russian name Small Off. Yeah, it's hell. 
it's 12 weeks of the worst 12 weeks of your life. And all you do is squat. You squat heavy with a lot of volume four times a week. And I did small off with the frame of mind that I was going to be the strongest junior squatter in the country. And I was going to beat Barry Piggott and there was no fucking nothing in my mind. So I went from someone who could squat like maybe 180, 190 kilos to someone who could squat like 250 kilos, you know, within a year. Um, and there was times, and this is the, where the madness comes in. This is the, you know, there is a madness and excellence. And I can remember that period. I haven't pushed myself that hard since because there's, you lose yourself in that, you know, and I was obsessed, consumed with that. And I could see every day I'd wake up and I'd see that fucking number. I'd see, I, I could imagine the venue that I was lifting at. I could see the crowd. I could see how the plates were stacked on the bar, what the rack looked like, who my spotters were. I could see what the floor was. I could feel what that floor was like under my feet. You know, it was a carpet, it was a wood. No, it was carpet and I could feel it, how, how it would set myself up. And I could walk myself and visualize through every single step of how I, got, I went through the squat. Um, and every time I trained, I could see that and I was making that reality happen over and over and over again. And I would have times where halfway through that program, my knees started giving out. I think my tendons were so swollen that my knees were just like fucking humming on a daily basis. I couldn't really bend my knees. It took me about 30 minutes to warm up. I remember one day in the gym, I had 215 kilos on the bar and it was my fourth day of squatting. I hadn't taken any recovery in week, like since the program started. I remember sitting in a rack and it was a Saturday night and it was like fucking much of the gym was open until fucking 10 o'clock. I think it was like half eight, nine o'clock on a Saturday night. Nobody there, just me, just me in complete silence. I remember saying it was a good gym called Raw. It's closed down. It used to be in Portobello and, uh, real fucking lifters gym like it was really fucking old school back then and i was just sitting in a squat rack and looking at this bar old fucking chalked up bar these old steel plates in this fucked up rack and it was just me and i remember writing this post i might go back and find it because it was quite profound and i remember taking this picture and it was in the middle of just like madness of trying to be the best um and i was like there's no one here to get there's no, this is what it's about there's no one here to fucking support you it's you and the fucking voice in your head you know, and it's who's going to fucking win. And all powerlifting for me, lifting for me was always a, it was always a physical expression of something a little bit darker. You know what I mean? Um, like I obviously came up in a loving family, but I came up in a, I have been through a lot of shit in my life, you know, and that kind of makes me the man I am now. Powerlifting was very much a physical expression of fighting those things, fighting those demons. And when it would be me and the bar and how, if you see any of my max attempts, I would be very, very ang visibly emotional and angry because that's exactly what was happening. I was exercising that part of me, you know, um, the bullied kid or, you know, the fucking, the fat kid and every, you know, all, all of those, all of those emotions that I've had my whole life, like they would come to the fucking surface. And when I would, when I would lift and when I would fight against the bar, that was what it was about, you know, and those were some of the biggest periods of discovery for me. I always say my character was kind of forged under a barbell. I wasn't always a confident kid, you know, or a person. I wasn't a, I never really backed myself. You proved yourself to yourself. So 110%. And no one did it for me. And it was totally off my own back. And I got fucking yeah. good at it. Like, I got good at it. Um, and that, that journey to do that, I never got to squat that. The heaviest I squatted was 255 in competition. The three... A month and a half before I was due to go to competition, I ended up getting a sebaceous cyst, an ingrown hair on the crack of my arse. <laughs> Believe it or not, not great, lads. Not great at all. So an ingrown hair, hair grows inwards, gets fucking inflamed or infected, and then it turned into a fucking cyst the size of a baseball on the crack of my whole baseball. So I was in hospital for a fucking week with that, and I had to get that thing fucking drained, and then... I had a fucking hole in my arse for, God, two holes in my arse for fucking weeks. Spare so arsehole, not the same. <laughs> couldn't squat, to totally derail, because you're talking a full open wound. Um, yeah. So I couldn't, uh, that was that fucking, and it was, that was my last competition to do the 260. And I, it was like, okay, well, I'm no longer a junior. Fuck, didn't do it, you know? Um, right. And that was always, that was, but, but it wasn't even that. I can remember, 
remember at the time it being such an obsession, such a fucking, like it was all I thought about. I would think about, I would think about the session I was going to have and I'd be driving around the country. I'd be like in Kerry in the fucking West of Ireland or I'd be in Mayo and I'd be driving back to Dublin to train and it would be all, my thought process would be total obsession, total fucking like I am going to be the best. I am going to beat everyone. I'm going to prove everyone wrong. That was another thing about lifting and this is why you can get an addiction to something. This is why people can kind of get a bit narcissistic. I never really got massively narcissistic with lifting, but it was always, it was always, I've always had a chip on my shoulder because I've always felt that people doubted me. I've always felt that people, you know, would not expect me to do well or pit, you know, chips against me. And that was always in my mind. I always loved being that underdog, whether it was playing rugby or whatever. So powerlifting was, that was my thought process. I'm going to fuck everyone. I'm going to prove everyone wrong, you know. Um, you were you were banging out you were banging out the squats. Was there one of them three disciplines? Not that you didn't like, but you were you were weak at deadlift. Deadlift, Dead, yeah. Hated deadlifts. Still not a naturally good deadlifter. I'm not at all. Obviously, a lower back injury from rugby, so I have to yeah. pull fucking sumo stance, um, which I get used to and whatever else. Now it's just powerlifting is a weird one. I would never be a world-class powerlifter necessarily. I could lift to an elite level, but I would never be a world-class powerlifter based on genetics is the wrong word. Lever lengths. Lever right. lengths. Think about it like this. What the fuck's your name? I even have that down here as one of the questions, what you're saying about the sumo stance. Like when I was watching documentary, everything before, everything from 10 years ago or more, the feet are for the deadlift. Are they almost like they're so wide? They're right at the edge. Of the, yeah, of the plate, yeah. yeah. And the top. hands are in like this, and then it looks like they have to bring it up less or whatever. Did they change that as a rule? No, nope. you can deadlift sumo or conventional. Conventional would just be a regular deadlift. You're down, set your feet hip width. You're down, chest yeah. up, hips down. Sumo would be feet wide, hands between the legs and you go to pick it up from there. So there's less pressure on the back and you can utilize your glutes a little bit more. Everyone's leverages are different, right? That just comes down to how you're formed as a person. Sumo naturally suited me because I, I had a bad back and sumo didn't affect my back nearly as bad. I can't deadlift conventional heavy. It doesn't work. My lower back, I can literally feel the vertebrae like doing that, which isn't a good thing, you know, so I avoid it. But like I would never be able to lift at a world class level because of le like something called a lever length. So think about it like this: the length of my arms in proportion. I've got a really long torso, and I've got like short enough. I've got like short enough arms. So that means I've got fucking very very stocky legs as a result. So my squat naturally, I'm a very good squatter. You know what I mean? I'm built to squat. I'm a terrible deadlifter because I've got really long torso really long torso, long legs, and short arms. So when I go to pick up the fucking bar, it's like, as if I look at You, you have to get down lower just because I of the I physically of have to move it over longer distance. Whereas you look at someone like Andy Whitaker, or I've trained with people who have super long arms, like arms down to their fucking knees. Like my arms barely go down past my waist, whereas some people go down past their knees. That's like that much difference, that much difference. So when you're talking about lifting maximal weight off the fucking floor, that is the that's like a hundred kilos there. Do you understand? Like that's yeah, the course. difference. So if we look at lever lengths, even small things, like did you know even if I have if I have a longer bicep versus a shorter bicep, I'm also going to be a weak deadlifter. So you see that this is a bicep tendon, right? Mm -hmm. Now the higher up this tendon goes the weaker your, your deadlift is going to be. The longer it is, the more force you can produce in that, in that joint. I know we're getting technical here, but there's a, the, the best female powerlifter in the world. What the fuck is her name? Anyway. I watched a video on her last night. Yeah, she's a black chick from the States. And my girl I used to lift with, who's a world-class powerlifter now, Shannon, um, she used to train with her a lot. And, you'd, and her dead, like, you're talking a 70-kilo woman who can deadlift 290 kilos drug free so you would look at them you'd look at the body and i see that her arms are insanely long and she's got this like her core is thick like abs you got abs but like not like fitness model abs like 
literal, it's not a V, it's thick abdominal wall. So they actually train people that are that strong, like their lower backs and their ab muscles are like built like fucking brick shit houses. Whereas naturally for me, I'm a V shape. You know, I would be grand if I did something like bodybuilding or Olympic weightlifting. Like I'm not designed to be the strongest because I've got like a little, I've got a small waist and wide shoulders. Whereas these people, they're just squares. They're just block humans. They're not massively athletic, but they're cock strong. Um, they add up your weight. Is that what they do for the competition? They add the three weights that's together. That's your total. That's your total. So your squat, you have three attempts on the squat, three attempts on the bench, three attempts on the deadlift. You usually start with the with the, your first attempt is your lightest. You get heavier, and then a max attempt at the last one. You do the same thing for bench. Do the same thing for deadlift. The judge, you get three judges then that look at you from different angles, and they'll judge whether you completed the lift correctly or not. So for your squat, obviously, your hips have to get down quite low, below parallel, to be deemed a good lift. If you squat high, you'll get a red light, and you don't get the lift. You know, um, for your bench press, like it's a pause, so like down to your chest wait till the bar becomes motionless and then they'll go press and you have to press from there. Um, so if you don't pull, if you don't hold the pause, you don't follow the command, no lift deadlift. Very simple. The only thing you need to do, pick the fucking bar up and um, stand at the top securely with it. And then don't drop it. You have to place it back down. That's, that's the sport, you know, that's the sport. It's a bizarre sport, but it's far more technical than people think, you know, to get it done properly. Yeah, it's very, very fucking cool. I like, I like the, deadlift and I like the squats and I'm drilling the bench press. Okay. You have outliers that will like say for example, right? The world the best in cycling, the world's best sprinter of all time is a guy called Peter Sagan, who yeah. races now. And he wins the green jersey in the last four or five Tour de France's. He will never win the Tour de France. Never, ever, ever. It's, it's literally impossible for him to win the Tour of France. But Why? nobody would ever be him on the because he can't climb mountains. He's too big. You have to be small. This is with the massive legs. No, no, no. They're track cyclists. Oh. They, they can't even compete in the, in the Tour de France because yeah. they're too heavy. But um, So the Tour de France is an overall score, like what you're saying in powerlifting, right? So it's over, it's over 21 days, 2,500 kilometers, right? Yeah. And whoever completes all of that in the shortest amount of time, is going to win the Tour de France. So out of them 21 days, uh, Peter Sagan will probably win 12 of them. Yeah. And Chris Froome or Gerhard Thomas might win three, but Chris Froome or Gerhard Thomas will always win the Tour de France over Peter Sagan. So when Sagan wins, it's, it's a sprint finish, and you have 40 or 50 people that are sprinting for the last 50 meters, and he's just so explosive and powerful. And his team is so good at boxing him in for the whole race that he has all of his matches to burn at the end. But when he wins, he wins by 0.1 or 0.2 of a second. Or, or maybe a second if it's a crazy race. You know what I mean? If he has a mad lead out, he might win by one whole second. Yeah. Whereas when Chris Froome wins his three races, it's the mountain stage. And he will win that by three minutes or four minutes or five minutes or six minutes. Interesting. So he will always win. Chris Froome will always win the Tour de France over. Peter Sagan, but he would never beat him in a sprint. Yeah. So in, power, in powerlifting, where I'm getting here, if you have somebody who is better than absolutely everybody at one, and it, it's always got to be somebody that does all three. But you're not, you know, that person isn't okay. going to do, you know, he's it, generally it's not going to be a person that does the absolute best squat, best bench. And yeah. You know what I mean? You have these outliers that will be an absolute god at one. Yeah. Or won't win because they can't venture. Ray well. Williams. So Barry Piggott would be like, he'd be one of those people who is masterful at all three. He's the most technical fucking lifter. He, he came and coached me for a session once when I was working in a place in Black Rock. And it was so, like, I, I know my shit when it comes to technique and lifting. And this guy was giving me shit that was like, fucking haven't even, like, he, it was just, a, it, was, it was like, it was a different level. It was like a lifting savant. So when you go, you look at him and you look at his technique, it's like, holy fuck. It's like looking at, I can even pull up a fucking a video to give you an example. It's like he... And if he went to a meet, would he win all three disciplines? Yes. He would be, he would be very, very much like... Um, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't absolutely smash everyone in every discipline, but he would, he would definitely... Um, 
he would definitely just pip everyone at the at the post, you know. So it would just be as you said with the Peter Sagan thing, it would be, you know, small margins, but he'd still win. You know what I mean? And would so, you have cunts that would be like absolutely awful at squat and bench? And then they're an absolute freak. Like you've guys like Ray Williams then, um, this thing's all wonky. So that's a two hundred and eighty five kilo squad. You see the way he he lifts He's very, very technical when he does stuff. This two ninety fives would be his second attempt. I'll speed this up a small bit so we can fucking so we can see what the crack is. So you'll notice how how technical he is when he goes in. Like everything is measured. He takes his time with shit. You know, it's the same thing every single time. He's methodical about it. Perfect depth gets it done. So you have you have someone like him who's a fucking freak of nature across the board. And then you'll have someone like Ray Williams. Ray Williams is the strongest squatter ever, ever. And um, he's this massive black dude. I've seen him in person. He's not yeah. on steroids. He's, I'm, not on, I'm not seeing him, seeing him, I've seen him. On. He's, drug, he's, he's drug free and he's squat, out squatted everyone who's ever on steroids. You know, like Brilliant. the level, and he's such an outlier. He's such a... For, he's a good bencher and he's a good deadlifter, but his squat is like, what the fuck is even going on? With powerlifting, it takes a very special person to do all three the best. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Kazmaier is the legendary. Bill Kazmaier is my favorite, my favorite person in strength or any, probably in any sport ever. I remember God, I went to a seminar of his and I met him in person and he was so fucking awesome. He was a fucking great person, but... Back in the day, him and Jeff Capes, Joff Capes or Jeff Capes, whatever the fuck, used to be the world's strongest man in the late 80s. And that was the rivalry. And um, there was him, John Paul Sigmerson and Jeff Capes, three absolute legendary figures in strength. Like three, five, there was like a top five legendary people of all time. Those three would be in it and they were competing at the same time against each other. So Bill Kazmaier was this guy who he, he was the powerlifting champion of the world and he was the world's strongest man at the same time. Do you know what I mean? So he was the strongest on the squat bench and deadlift, and he was also the world's strongest man, which, just, which it requires you to be highly athletic. And I remember him say, he, he said it, and he was like, it takes a very, very special person to be able to excel at all disciplines. Um, do you have to pick, do you have to say your three weights beforehand and yeah. not tell everybody else? Is that real? Is that, is that still the way it's done? Yeah? yeah, you have to give your first attempt. Not your second and third. The second and third are determined depending on. So, like, this is an interesting one. Like, there was a comp, not my last competition, but the one before that, I was competing against a, a powerlifter who was about 10 years older than me. He was actually someone I looked up to for years, and then I was competing head to head with him um, on the squat. And we were similar numbers. I think I was, I was a little bit stronger than him on the squat, but he was a bit fucking wiser to what was going on. So, he was always the attempt after mine. So he looked at my first attempt and then he based his next attempt on what I was putting up. So if my first attempt was like 235 or 230, it might've been fucking 230 or something like that. He'd go, okay, cool. I'll do 220. I'll do 227 as opposed to 220, you know? And then he'd look at my next attempt. My next attempt will be 240, 245. And then his would be 237, you know? So he was always, he knew he wasn't as strong but he was kind of staying with me in terms of the numbers we were putting up. And then I put up my last attempt, which was, I think that day I did 250 and he did 250 as well. I smashed the 250 and he just about got it. And that was a moment. He had to, he had to do 250 a martyr because that was the third one. No, he matched my attempt. So he said, so I did 250, he did 250. Um, because he could see, I put that up on the numbers on the board. Like, and, uh, at that moment, it's like, fuck, I should have gone 252. I would have had him. You know, if I'd have gone 252, he would have failed it. I guarantee he would have failed it. But he was just that, he, on the day. Powerlifting's a weird sport. It's who the fuck shows up on the day. All the preparation in the world. And then, like, I'm, kind of, I'm the kind of person who loves that shit. I love, conf I love comp competitiveness and confrontation. Some powerlifters are a bit fucking nerdy and weird. And they don't, like, I'm very open, aggressive, showman. You know, I love that shit, screaming on stage, all of it. Um, whereas some people are a bit quieter. So when someone challenges me like that, I fucking up my game and I want to do, do better. Um, but that was just an example, that you put your first attempts in 
a, a month before the competition and then really? on the day you have to see you, you might get you might have seen people bomb out of a meet on the squat so let's say like you bomb out of the meet did their first attempt on squat failed it did their second attempt because i've seen powerlifters come in and they try and cut weight so like i was competing there was a point i think i was competing at 105 kilos for most of my competitions and then some of them were 100 the 105s i remember there was a guy who cut like 12 kilos or something two stone to try and get and this isn't we're not talking ufc fucking like you know special you know cutting weight program we're talking fucking like in a warehouse in glass nevin you know at fucking six great in black bags lying down in the town up to try and cut fucking weight remember this lad tried to cut weight because he's like right well if i can compete at 105 or fucking do whatever and I watched him come in and weights that he was doing for like five to 10 reps in training, like repping it out, no problem. He came in, first attempt, one rep on the first attempt, failed. Second attempt, thought it was just a bad technique, fault, whatever, up the weight for the second attempt, failed. Then did the same thing on the third attempt, failed, bombed out. So if you fail the first three squats, you're gone. You can't do the bench, you can't do the deadlifts out of the competition. And you have to put your weights in a month beforehand, like when you sign up. Beforehand. It's very, powerlifting is very strategic though, man. When you get down to that level, you know what your numbers are. As I was saying yeah. to you, when I got into powerlifting, I was so fixated <coughs> on my program. I'm real fascinated with my programming. I would have percentages. I'll do, th- I'll do three sets of five at fucking, you know, the, week one, I'll do three sets of five at uh, like, 77.5 percent of my one rep max then week two i'll come in and i'll do you know four sets of four at 82 percent. you know what i mean these are vague numbers that i'm throwing out here but i would calculate that so when i walked into the gym i had all my sets written down already so it was just a matter of me going in and executing on them so that's why we get excited about shit because i could think of that i knew what i was going to do before i did it you know and that's would you know who's going to be in who's going to be at the meet or yeah yeah you would always know you could find that's out like it's not words like my last like i want to get back into competing now um now once i get my fucking shoulder right that'll be my next move is getting myself strong as fuck again um and 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 getting back into competition but uh all I, the chef it lads in the chef it t-shirt spotting you uh, Go on. um so what the fuck was i going to say there um getting back, back into competing yeah, getting back into competing, but it was with numbers and shit like that, man. Like you, you're you're calculating constantly with that. There was something before that, that I forgot, but anyway, uh, but you calculate constantly on what you're going to do, so you know you know where you're at. Some people like to come in and use fucking you know RPE. Uh, I know I use RPE for you guys, but you kind of use a bit of intuition to know how heavy something is or how heavy something should be. For me, I'm one of those people that I need to black and white for myself. It's like, this is what you're going to do. And you need to fucking prepare correctly to go in and do that, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, that's if parallel. You, when you go down, if you go down to the gym tomorrow morning, do you build up from a bar? Or do you do what we do? Like, I don't, obviously, because, not obviously, but I do my, my fun lifts, as I'm calling them, because it's not bang on what's on my program. I'll go and I'll do my supersets first, my triceps. And then I will finish off with whatever that day is, the squat, the bench, or the trap bar, and then go and do my... Jesus. Yeah. My, 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 my fun lifts. Because, you know, like this, like I wouldn't be able to... I wouldn't be able... Like yesterday's session, I'm not going to be squatting 80 kilos with no bar, with no box, for 12 reps. Yeah. Four times. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm keeping weights low as prescribed. And then after that, then I'm doing my superset. And yeah. then I can say, right now, I'll Oh, okay, one. I get you, I get you. You I know what you. I mean? Yeah, I thought you were just leaving the squats completely until the end. No, 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 no. Because like them squats, is, it, yesterday's squats is not going with heavy weights. It's going big numbers. Yeah. Totally. And then when I'm finished then, in between my lifting sessions, my two supersets and my cardio, then I can go and do my... I call them my fun lifts, but it's a bit that I want to do myself. Do you know that way? Yeah. Where I'm doing two or three reps with a bit of weight. Yeah, like uh, with stuff like that, I would always, uh, the, the warm-up sets are my chance to get, like if I started an empty bar, it's my chance to get volume in. You know what I mean? So I'll fucking bang out 20 or 30 reps of the bar. 
um, and then I'll do I'll do about three or four warm up sets before I get up to my heavier weights. But obviously, the stronger you are, the harder. You know what I mean? I'm not going to go straight from an empty bar to 180 kilos or 200 kilos. Like you're fucking, yeah. you're asking for trouble there. So you need a good bit of warm up uh, to get through that. Um, so yeah, for me, I'll, I'll 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 go from an empty bar and I'll work my way up and play. With, with, with this month's training program, you're well fucking warmed up. Fucking absolutely mangling, you lads. Mangled. It's exactly what you want. Um, Big yeah, time. Training. You've got some crackling going on there, pal. Um, I'd say we could take probably one more, Pedro, before we fucking wrap this lad up. Right. So um, with the RDLs, why are we lifting it off of the hang instead yep. of taking it up off the ground? Is that protecting your back because you're doing because the weights are different or because the lift is different? Or yeah, um, so both are working. Let's, for number one, I'm going to say this: like an R, what's it, first off, an RDL has got a Romanian deadlift where you pick it up out of a rack and then you fucking hinge with your hips, you push your arms back, uh, take it down to your knees, feel a good stretch in your hamstrings, and you come back up. Whereas a deadlift would be you actually just pick dead weight off the floor using the same muscles. Um, what's better which should you be using whatever else if you're not a power lifter you do not need to be doing straight bar deadlifts from the floor unless you really want to but you don't particularly have to be doing it so the way i program is like i'm not training power lifters people get very confused with their training when they're like oh well i should be, should i be doing this what's the best it depends what you want to do you know like the last thing we're I doing did... our rdls with the dumbbells yep yeah totally so I'd have you as varying dumbbells or barbells or whatever. Um, the idea is it's a much, much safer variation that you can load up a good bit of weight on and you can make those muscles very, very strong. Whereas when you're deadlifting from the floor, like think about the range of motion. You start from your hips, down to your knees, and back up. That's a very yeah. safe range of motion. You're, the risk of injury is very low. So you go from a deadlift off the floor, it's like, the good majority of chefs will struggle with posture issues. So your shoulders will be rounded forward. You're struggling getting into that chest position. I don't deadlift from the floor because it puts me at risk of injury. And I've done my yeah. back in several times doing it. It's not that deadlifts are bad for your back. It depends on the person. Like if you deadlift correctly with lightweight, you'll be fine. But this is why I use a trap bar deadlift instead of a straight bar deadlift. You can still pick weight. Yeah, up so yeah, you, yeah, with the trap bar, the handles are up nice and high. Yeah, on the side. So there's no bar yeah. in front of you. So now you can bend your knees and get your chest into a higher position, which takes all the pressure off your lower back. You know, Whereas if the bar is in front of you and it's slamming off your shins, now it's called something called a shearing force. Shearing force means it's pulling on the spine as opposed to just, you know, uh, it, as opposed to just pressure on your body. It's actually directly applying, which isn't a bad thing. Your spine is designed to take a lot of fucking pressure. It's designed to deal with it. But when you've got for hundred uh, years, yeah. But when you've got posture issues and you've got flexibility issues and you de your mobility isn't fantastic, you're gonna struggle and it's gonna put you at risk. Whereas if you move like a fucking ninja, yeah, sure, you can deadlift from the floor. Go and look at a Chinese weightlifter if you want to see what a fucking ninja looks like, you know, <laughs> because that's exactly their height. Like they're so mobile, it's insane. I'm not like that, so. And I know the chefs I coach aren't like that either. So for me... What it, muscle group has been worked the most with hinge? And hands, so your posterior... So you've got two chains. So yeah. posterior chain. Posterior means the back, the rear. You know what yeah. I mean? Derriere. So the posterior chains, your hamstrings, those big fucking, you know, stretched out bits of dough on the back of your, on the back of your legs. Your glute muscles, which are your arse muscles that extend from basically the bottom of your arse up to all the way up to the top. Um, and then your spinal erectors. Your spinal erectors are like the two fucking fillets that go down your spine. And then obviously yeah. all the lower back muscles as well and your lats. That's your posterior okay. chain. So RDLs would m work those muscles but it would work a lot more of your hamstrings. Whereas if you go down to the floor with a regular deadlift, you're now working a lot of your lower back and your lats as well. So it's a full body exercise, but because it's a straight bar and it's out in front, it does apply a bit of pressure to the back. So if you don't have your shit together, it's going to give you issues potentially. Whereas if you have your trap bar, that removes that from the equation completely. So it means you can deadlift pain-free or risk-free, not risk-free, but generally with a lot less risk than a straight bar. 
exercise is all about like it's what you want to do for the good majority of people you don't need to be straight bar deadlifting i hold to that and i'm a powerlifter and i do that for my sport because it's there's it's a steep learning curve to do it correctly if you want to do it happy days go for it and learn it properly but if you don't like i just know for myself from the amount of people that i've coached to do this like there's i'll build someone into it but it'll take me months you know it'll take yeah. me months to get someone to deadlift the way they need to be deadlifting um it's a skill and it's and it's and it's technical so unless you're technically good at it you're putting yourself at risk you know yeah um, so for yeah. rdls and any of those exercises that i select it's because i want bang for i want bang for my buck and i want safety at the same time yeah and with the or with the with using you know you a lot more balance involved as well when you're using the two dumbbells and the rdl so variation as well very fun it's very very fun totally you want variation but you want consistency at vary and variation at the same time does that make sense so it's like yeah, you, yeah. you know like an rdl with a barbell a straight bar and an rdl with dumbbells you could do an rdl with a kettlebell you know they're all hinge patterns they're all working similar muscle groups a kettlebell swing um you know a good morning which you can do with a fucking band or a bar like they're all working the same muscle groups, but they're giving slightly different stimulus. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you just do the same, that the law of accommodation means that you just give your body the same shit over and over and over again. It's just going to go. I I know this. Why well, I'm not going to get bigger or stronger here. Like I know I've already been through this shit. You keep giving me the same exercise. Whereas if you give me a similar movement pattern but you give me a different variation of it. Everybody's going, oh, I like that. That's why I'll go from barbells to dumbbells, dumbbells to kettlebells. You change, you vary the implement that you're using. Yeah, exactly. You know, That's why I'll go from moving fast to moving slow. Variation. I'm doing the same movement, but I'm varying it. My body's now going, shock the body. I fucking hate that term because it means that it's random. It's not random. It's yeah. very designed. Um, yeah. So like there's a million ways to vary the same thing and varying the same thing is the key to long-term results mm. and, and making changes. And that's probably well, what I could literally talk about this for another five hours. Yeah. And you guys, so, yeah, well, cut it. me off. Yeah. You, you guys are all, um, there's a reason that a lot of you have continued to make progress because you've made progress in the right way where it's kind of intelligent, the lifting that you're doing. You're, you're Every four weeks, we're changing to something new, and they tend to stack on top of each other like fucking building a house or building a pyramid. And over time, you can see you're just continuing month by month. You're just building and building and building and building and building and building. And eventually, after a year or two, you're going to go, holy fuck, I actually i am really good at lifting weights now. You know. Um, whereas most people, it's random shit. It's random. They do random bollocks in the gym, you know? And that's the don't problem. do random shit people listen yeah. to your body Work your way up. yeah exactly exactly and with that ladies and gentlemen give us a thumbs up on the video subscribe to the channel podbean create a profile share it around five-star review on itunes check us out follow us on all various social media platforms chef fit on facebook chef fit project on instagram um check yourself before you wreck yourself shotgun bullets are bad for your health my friends that's been episode 40 i've been cam that's peter over there stay safe motherfuckers peace yeah. <laughs>